Yeah. Um, then see you again next Monday. Right. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so we can start. Um, just as you see, um, I'm called Shaha, which is a very complicated uh, name to pronounce. So there's also this Leon in the middle, and Brenner is my last name, which is also a bit German, so you can um, approach me with either of these uh, or a combination of them, it's okay. And yes, it's true, I would like you guys to talk today, because um, I think right, the main uh, idea about this lecture is for me to enjoy it. And I think I'll enjoy it if you enjoy it, right? So we'll try and do this together. Uh, I've, did, I've done several lectures uh, with uh, people in Germany and I, I had to be quite harsh and like, you tell me what you think. So I might do it, okay? So be ready, okay? Uh, this series is a series of four lectures. Uh, it's going to revolve the philosophy of thought. This is the first one. It's about Descartes, which I love dearly as a person that does philosophy for a long time. Next time we're going to talk about paradoxes, which is also cool. And then we have a lecture about consciousness, uh, which is interesting, uh, the uh, structure of consciousness, etc. And finally, we'll have a, a lecture about the unconscious, which is a subject that I hold very dearly, because as Masha said, uh, my expertise is psychoanalysis, and specifically uh, Lacan, and actually the psychoanalysis of autism. From there, I have this expertise in the philosophy of mind, and that's what we're going to speak about today. Okay? So that's a brief introduction. That's my email. Please feel free to write me an email about any question. I really love it. And that's my website where I post some um, ideas from time to time if you're interested. Um, so today we're going to talk about Descartes, and uh, specifically about this book, uh, which I brought today. It's a, a, the Hebrew version but actually it's translated to most languages today. And I believe that if you guys want to be intellectuals, uh, except for you guys with the glasses here, though you're on your way, it's okay. But if you want to truly be an intellectual, or at least pretend to be one in a party, you have to know this book by heart. Okay, so we're gonna discuss the first two parts of this book. I'm going to give you sort of like an interpretation of these parts and we're going to see what's so cool about Descartes and about this argument that he presents in uh, this book called Meditations. Uh, now just a bit about Descartes, uh, here he is, uh, as you can see quite, uh, quite the hipster with this mustache and everything. Uh, he is a French-born philosopher, and in the philosophy department, we call him the father of modern philosophy. I'll explain why later. That's maybe the main idea about this lecture. Uh, he lived in the 16th and 17th century, uh, a very exciting time for science. Uh, Galileo points his telescope to space and finds out that... You know, guys, what Galileo was was saying eventually? Almost. The, that's some guys before him. Not about the earth, the earth and the sun, so... I see you getting there. Right. So the earth is not the center of the universe. Uh, Copernicus also had these ideas, but Galileo takes the, his telescope and sort of in this area, in this phase of scientific revolution, he was the one basing that. Eventually, didn't work so well for him, right, uh, personally. But he said, yeah, heliocentrism, that means that the Earth revolves the Sun and not the other way around. Uh, now, Descartes is also a scientist. That's what we need to remember. He's a scientist and a mathematician before he's a philosopher. And if you studied math, I, I guess even in school, you run into some of his ideas like Cartesian, what, what is this, the Cartesian axis, the x, y, the thing that you had to do, this whole thing with the x and y, that's Descartes, he invented that. So all these like horrific mathematical things that we had to learn as young uh, adults, that's uh, Descartes. Um, more than that, he was also a devoted Catholic, which is another interesting point about his philosophy, which is scientific and also Catholic, because God is present there. God is a major part of the argument in this book. We will get to that, and if you'll be interested, uh, we can even prove the existence of God two times, 
if you want. Um, you don't have to, only if you want. Uh, now, the thing that we're going to start is what is called Cartesian skepticism. Now, René Descartes, that's his name, but he, uh, just like, uh, I guess his name is Wayne uh, Johnson, right? Wayne The Rock Johnson, right? That's The Rock, you know, this actor? So it's sort of like the same, that's the hip-hop rapper name of Descartes. Cartesius, okay? So everything you hear, Cartesian, that's Descartes, and also we have what is called Cartesian skepticism, okay? That's the major point uh, for today. Now, just skepticism in general, I, I always like to bring up this guy, which has maybe the coolest name in the history of philosophy, uh, Sextus, Imp Sextus Empiricus, yeah? Um, and he's a, a very big skepticist in the history of philosophy. Uh, he's part of this, what is called the Pyrrhonian skepticism in the third century. That's way, way long ago. Now, this guy was really uh, against everything. And he had this book that we uncovered that's called Against the Mathematicians. And in this book, uh, Sextus is actually skeptic about Gra a grammar, about rhetorics, about geometry, about arithmetics, astrology, music, etc., etc., etc. He says nothing is valid, nothing is true, we shouldn't believe in anything. That's why I see him a bit as a emo sort of philosophy, everything is bad, we shouldn't do anything. He invents this uh, concept called epoche, which is used later on if, if any of you are in is interested in Husserl, a uh, German philosopher, he used this concept in his phenomenology. And epo epoche is actually this suspension of judgment. So if I ask you, what do you think about Trump? You say, I suspend my judgment. I do not say anything, right? Which is quite annoying. Uh, so this is this guy. And I want to just sort of uh, equate the three forms of skepticism. That's the guy you already know. Uh, first one is philosophical skepticism. Philosophical skepticism is very systematic skepticism that takes a specific concept or specific idea and is skeptic about it until it reaches some conclusions. I got here, like, just read this article by Bertrand Russell. I really don't recommend reading it. It's called On Denoting. And in this article, Russell actually asks uh, if the term the Queen of England actually denotes the Queen of England in actuality. It's a very pressing philosophical question, I agree. Uh, and he gets to the conclusion that yes, it does. Okay, so that is philosophical skepticism. We take something specific and we doubt it, and then we get to a specific conclusion. A Pyrrhonian a skepticism doubts everything. It doesn't doubt a specific thing, it doubts all knowledge. And the outcome of this skepticism is, as you can see, a guy sitting under a tree, not doing anything, just chilling out and enjoying life. That was his conclusion. We shouldn't do all that stuff, we should just chill out under a tree. So that's Pyrrhonian and Sextus Empiricus. Now, Cartesian skepticism does doubt everything, but the outcome of this doubt is the certainty of knowledge. That's great. Right, that's completely different. It's supposed to be very productive. Um, now, philosophers, they love sex. I, I don't know why, but they do. Uh, and Descartes also loves sex, and he has this beautiful uh, allegorical uh, idea about knowledge. So let's imagine that all the knowledge that humanity has is a sack, which is full of apples, and the nice, beautiful red apples here are good ideas. And that rotten little apple there with the worm is a terrible bad idea. So a bad idea would be that the earth is flat. Now this allegory goes further because, you know, if we have one rotten apple in the sack, it starts to rot the other apples, right? So if we think that the earth is flat, then we probably can't... Uh, get a man to the moon, or at least tra travel around the world. So this, this idea sort of corrupts the other ideas that we have about reality. So that's a problem, and that's how Descartes sees knowledge. And what he says is, we need to get rid of the disgusting rotten apples. Simple. So how do you do that? Stick with the analogy. How would you get rid of this rotten apple if you had an apple full of sack? Eh, sack full of apples. What do you think? 
Sorry? Better ideas, but how do, I, how, do I, how do I just make sure that this sack is full of only ripe, beautiful red apples? Very simple. Yeah, exactly. You just reach your hand in, right, and you take out an apple, and you see if it's rotten, right? Let's say this is a rotten apple, so I throw it at you guys, and then I take my hand again, and this is a beautiful, nice apple, so what do I do? I put it back in again, right, and then I'm left with only beautiful ripe apples, but this is not true according to Descartes. This is not the way to do it. Because, you know, I can reach my hand, theoretically, I can reach my hand in, take up a beautiful apple, say, oh, this is beautiful, put it in, then take my hand again, oh, this is nice, put it in, and then do this even forever, but then on the bottom I have these like rotten apples which I just don't reach, right? So that's a problematic method. That's not the Cartesian method. So what's the other way to do it? Right, so we leave the sack intact, but at least we throw all, because you know, it's a sack, you know, and philosophers, they love it. You know? So we throw all the apples on the floor, empty the sack, sack is empty, and we go through the apples on the floor and only choose the ripe ones. And then we have a sack full of ripe apples. Great, this is Cartesian skepticism. This is how it works. We need to doubt everything, and after we doubt everything, we can start collecting our certainties and build our knowledge. And this is what Descartes wants to do. He wants to build this building, this huge tower of apples, which are only ripe, and like that base the sciences, because he's a scientist. Now, you see here metaphysics, that's, these are the roots. These are, this is the basis for physics, math, to base the other sciences, let's say even psychology, astrology, etc., etc., etc. But we need to start from the basis. By the way, metaphysics, uh, you know why it's called metaphysics? Because uh, Aristotle used, to, he wrote a book called Metaphysics. It wasn't called metaphysics, it just came after the book called Physics. Uh, so we found that book and we didn't have a name for it, so we call it metaphysics, and since that, everything which is a question about, you know, reality, which is a bit underneath physics, like what is the world? Does, do things exist, right? What is time, etc., etc. These are metaphysics because Aristotle used to ask that in that book. And never mind, we just regress, but as you can see, we have Descartes' book, Meditations, and we're gonna build our metaphysic back, metaphysical background. Then we can have these like mathematical equations, which are gonna be wonderful, not today, but gonna be wonderful for Descartes. And then eventually we're gonna explain the workings of a duck or something like that. Okay, that's the idea. Are we okay? Yeah? Okay. So, three major principles of Cartesian doubt. First, we start with the foundations. We don't waste time starting from the top. We, if the foundations of the house are rotten, then the house will collapse. Doesn't matter how beautiful he looks. So we start from the very basic ideas. Second, and this is very important, you're gonna see, we're only accepting ideas which are 100% certain. So how do we know that the idea is not 100% certain? We ask ourselves philosophical questions, and if we find even the minute minute clue that this is not 100% certain, we throw this apple on, on you or on other people, okay, and not put it in the sack. Okay, so that's a very important uh, principle. And the third one, because he's such a uh, responsible scientist, as if we have some problems as we go, we make a list and then we're gonna uh, think about it in the future. Okay, so these are the principles. Are you ready? Good. We're gonna start. And yeah, I really see this book as sort of like a video game because it has like several levels and you just have these, each level you need to overcome a specific um, challenge and eventually you get to truth. So we're going to find some truth today in this game. Uh, the book is called Meditations on First Philosophy. You can find it in German under this name. Today we're going to go over the complete first meditation. Don't worry, it's not going to be very didactic, it's going to be great. And uh, the second meditation, we're going to do the beginning of it, which is also uh, important. And this is the, a picture of the original book from a library in France. So, we'll start with an intro. I'm going to do some, some reading uh, of the book. 
uh, and I'm, uh, I'm going to try and do it in my fake French accent because uh, I don't, we don't have any French people in the crowd because every time I read, I read Descartes, I read it in a French accent because it's beautiful. You know, the, and that's why I'm going to quote from him and in the next couple lectures we're not going to quote anything but Descartes is so dramatic and so vivid. Um, so let's start with a dramatic intro and Descartes goes like this. Uh, some years ago, I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I had accepted, uh, well, I, I'll just stop with this, uh, that I accepted as true in my childhood, and by the highly doubtful nature of the whole edifice that I had subsequently based on them. Right? He finds these errors that as a young child he used to believe in. I realized that I was it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything completely and start again right from the foundation if I wanted to establish anything at all in the sciences that was stable and likely to last. So here Descartes gives us his goal to put some substantial ground for science. And he says, okay, I need to do it now and if you continue reading, he also talks about the fact that he had to wait all these years, about 42 years, until he wrote this book, because he was not mature enough to doubt everything, and now he is in the right age to do this. By the way, um, you guys know uh, Kabbalah? Have you heard of that thing? It's like a very strange uh, Jewish interpretation uh, of, um, I don't know, Holy Scripture. And you cannot start doing the Kabbalah until you're 40 years old, and Evidently, Descartes was doing something very philosophical at that age. So, but don't worry, we'll be okay. Uh, we'll, we'll survive. Um, so we start from the destruction of the foundation. Nothing is true. We believe in nothing. Nothing in our world is valid. Not mathematics, not physics, nothing, nothing at all. And this is the beginning. Nothing is certain. Now, I want to ask you. And I put in this picture as like a clue. This is Galileo. I put this picture as a clue here. Where do we start? What's the most basic thing that teaches us what is true or not true in reality? Do you have any idea? This is where you guys enlighten me with your brilliant ideas. So how do we learn about reality? That is my question. Through our senses, excellent. So we need to look in the telescope in order to get to the conclusion that the sun is the object that the Earth revolves around and not the other way around, right? The senses, and Descartes is a scientist, and he says the same thing. We need to start with the senses. So he says maybe the senses, and what we will call sense data, is the thing upon which we can stabilize a truth. And I'm going to read a bit about this. Whenever I have up until now accepted as most true, I have acquired either from the senses or through the senses, right? But from time to time, I have found that the senses deceive, and it is prudent never to trust completely those who have deceived us even once. So he says, yeah, maybe it's the senses, but then he says, wait, the senses deceive me. Do you have any idea how? How do I, on a daily basis, how am I deceived by my senses? Magic, Magic right. That's a, good, that's a really good example, right. I have a brilliant trick where I hold a coin in my hand and I do as though I'm holding it in the other hand, but it's not really there. And, you know, you might believe that. So that's true. Magic is something like that. Um, Descartes gives some other examples, but I'm going to give some very commonsensical examples so you understand what Descartes means. Uh, for instance, if you look at the sky, and I know Berlin, it's kind of different because the sun doesn't show itself too much, but when it does, you can look at the sky, and trust me, the sun, like if you look at it from Earth, it's pretty much the same size in the sky as the moon seems like, but they are not the same size. So these are the senses telling us, hey, these are two objects in the same size, but in actuality, they're not. Another example here is this guy uh, posting a picture on Instagram of him standing next to the Eiffel Tower as, as though he is a giant. 
And you know, in the picture it looks like it from this specific perspective, like he is huge, but in actuality he's not. He's just standing closer to the lens. Now these are sort of commonsensical, but I want to give you another example which I really, really love. I don't know if you have seen this optical illusion, but I'll ask you, uh, what is the difference between the color in A and in B? You see this one is A and this one is B. The color of the letter is black, but the, the square itself, yeah, are they the same color? B is a bit lighter, right? Like, if not, then we'll talk after class, because then there's a very big problem <laughs> with, with the functionality of your visual cortex. But, I mean, every person that looks at it sees that A is a bit darker, right? But then I'm going to just put this guy there, and you see they're exactly the same color. I actually checked it on Photoshop, and they have the same RGB, color, RGB value, 101, 101, 101. But when we look again, they seem as though they have a different color, right? So this is a very, very good point that shows us senses tell us something, but in actuality, it is not true. And like we said, Descartes, if he takes an apple, and even if it's a little bit unripe, then we throw it in the garbage. So, it's not sense data. It's not sense data. I mean, that can't be the basis of validity, of certainty. So, Descartes does like a little movement here and he says, okay, maybe these are senses which are kind of, they're kind of far, you know, when I look at the sun, it's so far. Uh, of course, I'll do some mistakes, right? Because it's far from me. But then he says there are other kinds of senses which are closer. They're more intimate. Yeah? And maybe these are the basis for certainty. And he says, Yet, although the senses occasionally deceive us with respect to objects which are very small or in the distance, like we just showed, um, there are many other beliefs about which doubt is quite impossible, even though they are derived from the senses. For example, that I am here, sitting by the fire, wearing a winter dressing gown, holding this piece of paper in my hands, and so on. Winter dressing gown. Lovely. But then Descartes says that, and he means that, like we're right here, right now, you're sitting in front of this... PowerPoint presentation, and yeah, you're here. You can touch your hands, it's right here. We know we're here. These are like senses which are more valid. Like if I look to the other side of the street, I might think that this person is my friend and I will run and say hello, but it's not him because he was far. But when I look in the mirror, I look at my hand right now, I know I'm actually here. So then Descartes says, maybe this is the basis for validity, the intimate senses, right? So here we go. Level two, the intimate senses. This is the cart in his um, winter gown here. It's the pictures which I always love. Nevertheless, this does not work as well. Descartes talks about dreams and he says, how often asleep at night am I convinced of just such familiar events? that I am here in my dressing gown, sitting by the fire, when in fact I am lying undressed in bed. As I think about this more carefully, I see plainly that there are never any sure signs by means of which being awake can be distinguished from being asleep. So what does he mean here actually? Why are the intimate senses not a basis for validity? When do they fool us? In dreams, right. Because we all sometimes dream that we do something, that we run, that we shake a hand, that we smell a flower, I don't know. And in the dream, we really think this is real, this is reality. But then we wake up and it's not. So what we thought in the dream, what we intimately felt in the dream was not true. Now, maybe you think about lucid dreams. Do you know what that is? Yeah, lucid dreams. Uh, lucid dreams are dreams when you know you are sleeping. 
like um, you know you sometimes dream and you know you're dreaming so try to try and do some stuff when you do that but still that's not making Descartes argument invalid because even if you have lucid dreams some dreams are not lucid meaning some dreams deceive us some dreams make us believe that we are actually doing something that we're actually feeling something but we're not doing that in actuality and uh, this really reminds me of this uh, beautiful uh, poem about Zhang Shi. I really hope that's how you say it. I once asked a guy how to say it and he said Zhang Shi. Uh, you know this thing about Zhang Shi dreaming he's a butterfly? But then the question is it actually Zhang Shi dreaming he's a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming that he's Zhang Shi? And that's exactly the idea about the movie Inception. Have you seen this one? Yeah, really popular, right? Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio doing a good job there. It's about a dream within a dream within a dream. Do I know this is reality? This is the whole concept there. And also one of the four, no, make it five movies I like with Tom Cruise, <laughs> which is quite a lot, I have to say, uh, called Vanilla Sky. And um, that movie also deals with the question of reality and dream. So we can say they're sort of Cartesian, these movies. So. Yeah, no, do it right now. So. Yeah, we're, we're sort of trying to do it right now, right? We sort of cancel the senses as a basis for truth. Where will we get? I wonder if we'll get to the same place you're aiming at. You said spirituality, yeah. right? So, okay, keep, keep alert. Let's see if we're getting there. But that's true. We're sort of saying, okay, senses are not the basis for truth right now, okay? And that's sort of what Inception is trying to say as well. That's right. Yeah, thank you for that comment. So... Back to our video game, um, we started with nothing, then we thought maybe the uh, distance sense data will help us, but no, that doesn't work. And then we said maybe the intimate senses will be the basis for truth, but then we had the dream argument. And dream argument says no, that's not the basis for truth as well. So what can be the basis for, of certainty? Any ideas, guys? This is the idea about philosophy. You think about it. What can be more certain than our senses? You don't know the answer. Well, do. Ah, you, do, you do know the answer. So what is it? Uh, the fact that we sense. The fact... This is the Wait, but we are now with the senses and we said like that anything that we sense, even if it's distant and even if it's intimate, we still cannot val view it as valid, right? So we're sort of like taking a step from the senses. I think I'm picking up on your vibe, but we'll soon get there. I think so. What is it? What's the, let's say, the opposite of spirituality? You said, go to the spiritual. What's the opposite of spirituality when you think about it? Sort of rationality, right? Rationality, let's say the sciences, let's say let's say, thinking scientifically or mathematically. And that's what Descartes assumes. So may maybe it's not the senses, but it's actually everything that is not sensual, that is not empirical in science. Uh, so he says the following thing. Nevertheless, it might at least be admitted that certain other, even simpler and more universal things are real. This class appears to include the shape of extended things, the quantity or size and number of these things, the place in which they may exist, the time through which they may endure, and so on. Basically, Descartes says, okay, so it's not empiricism, it's not the senses, it's not these sciences, right? They're relying on our perception. And we said perception doesn't work for us. Maybe it's these sciences 
which they don't really need perception in order to be true. That's what Descartes says. If there are Kantians in the crowd, then it's okay, do not uh, scream. But that's what Descartes says. Okay. And he actually gives two compelling arguments that prove it. Um, he says, even in dreams, because the dreams were sort of the thing that made us skeptical about our senses, even in dreams, these truths, the universal non-empirical truths, are still valid. And the first thing he says that, is that even in my dream, when I see two apples and then I see three apples together, there's still five apples. And I know maybe fans of David Carroll here will not agree, but that's what Descartes says in this part. And maybe this is not so compelling, and it's interesting to see that Kant actually uses this argument later to say something completely opposite to Descartes. But then he gives the example of the square, which I really like because it's very intuitive. He says, it doesn't matter how much you try even, when you dream about a square, it will be a square. It will never have, let's say, three sides. Or we cannot imagine or conceptualize a round square. Right? There's, it's impossible. It's impossible to do that because geometrical truth dictates that a square has four sides. Right? So there's something, there's some limit to the capacity of the dream to you know, make these truths invalid. Do you get me on this one? Yeah? So some truths, some mathematical truths, Descartes says maybe they're the basis for certainty. Like arithmetics. Maybe we can base everything on arithmetics because even in the dream, they are true. So what do you think? Is this gonna hold? You'll probably catch the drift and not really. Okay, this is, doesn't hold water as well. Uh, here we go. We get to one of my favorite parts in this really lovely book, the evil demon argument. Yes, evil demons in philosophy. It's, uh, it's always nice to have demons in philosophy. There's also a whole concept of zombies in philosophy. We'll talk about philosophical zombies two lectures from now, which is also a, a whole field in philosophy. I'm not kidding. And the evil demon argument goes a little like this, and I'm going to give you another interpretation in a second. So, he says, let us suppose that some malicious demon of the utmost power and cunning has employed all his energies in order to deceive me. I shall think that the sky, the air, the earth, colors, shapes, sounds, and all external things are merely the delusions of dreams we, which he has devised to ensnare my judgment. So paranoid. I shall consider myself as not having hands or eyes or flesh or blood or senses, but as falsely believing that I have all these things. So this sounds a little strange, right? Why are we talking about this demon all of a sudden? Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you another version of this argument, a modern version uh, called the brain in a vat argument, because I believe you've been e even a bit exposed to Hollywood movies. Uh, this will work better. Okay? But again, remember the cat was leaving a long time ago, so demons were so more in at his time. So brain in a vat, let's say. Uh, let's imagine, could be possible I dare you to disprove me, yeah? I dare you, I really dare you to disprove me. Could be possible that, let's say you, right? You were born, and I'm talking to one person, but it's valid for each one of you, right? You were born, let's say, 10,000 years from now, okay? And when you were born, we had the technology uh, that enabled an evil professor, let's say, of philosophy, yeah? To take your little baby body, and out of your little baby head, take out your little baby brain and put it in a vat, in like, you know, like a box. And that box has all the nutrients to feed your brain, and your brain is connected with electrodes to this super mega computer, like 10,000 years from now, that feeds your brain with all the information that a regular brain would sort of experience in reality. And all that you believe, everything that you see is actually a simulation. 
right? So the idea that you have a body, that's a simulation. The idea that you went to school yesterday, that's a simulation, right? Could be possible, you know? I even take it further, you know, it could be possible, and now I'm getting a bit too much sci-fi, tell me to stop when, I, when, I'm over, when I've exaggerated. It could be that we are not even, you know, corporal beings. Maybe we don't even have a body. Maybe we were born a million years from now and we we're actually energetic beings, and an evil energetic being had kidnapped your brain, and now you think you're a human. You think you're this stupid, stinky, disgusting ape. But actually, this creature doesn't even exist. It's an invention of this energetic being that decided to toy with your, your mind and your life. So this could be possible, right? It could be possible that everything that we do and believe is actually a simulation. Well, yeah. So maybe it's true. So you're saying, yeah, maybe... But do you guys believe you're living in a simulation? That, that would be kind of weird. I would kind of... That would be weird. Do you think so? Have, have I convinced you that you're actually living in a simulation? Maybe, you said. I think the simulation is so good that we wouldn't even... Wouldn't even notice. Right. But can you... Yeah. It's pretty real. That's the only real we know. Right? Does anybody have an idea that might disprove this? That might prove that you are not in a simulation? Any idea? So, yeah, maybe we're in a simulation, huh? You have an idea? I knew it. I, I just thought about like, the free will uh -huh. that just discussed. Yeah. So, how does that prove we're not in a simulation? That's a good point. What do you think? Why do you think free will shows that we're not in a simulation? Oh, okay. Well, fr free will is actually a valid point. It's interesting because we do have free will. And why would the simulation have us have free will? It's a good question. I, I think the matrix answers it. Right? Have you seen the matrix? Only see the first one. Do not see the other ones. Uh, but in the matrix, uh, people are sort of plugged into this computer. It's kind of cool because the robots took over the world and humans are now just biological batteries connected to a simulation, enjoying their life, la la la. And what the bad guys say is that they have made humans, you know, have this experience of the real world uh, because, you know, this makes them last longer, right? It also makes them think they are uh, not a simulation. That they're not a simulation, right. It's convincing us. It's true. Although it would be really cool, you know, if this evil demon would actually make us know we're in a simulation, and that's even worse, you know. We know we're in a simulation, there's nothing to do, sort of like laughing in the background, you know. So yes, we're stuck with this problem, yes. How about what if we don't have anything that proves that we are actually in a simulation? Mm. That is absolutely valid. We have no proof that we're in a simulation. But do you have proof that we're not? That's what I'm asking. You're asking if I have proof that we are. No, this is purely a philosophical uh, idea. It's sort of a question you ask yourself. What if, what if? And that's possible. It's not preposterous, yeah? Yeah. So, ah. Mm. So I'll tell you what, Descartes is definitely not going to support that. Descartes is a rationalist, okay, and philosophy from Descartes was split into the rational, rationalist and empiricist. And Descartes says, no, there's something more than the simulation. We'll try to find out, right? But right now we're stuck with this evil demon and nothing is true. Here I recommend on two movies, The Matrix and Dark City, if you're more of a sci-fi fan. Dark City is like a bit more hardcore. And again, the idea of we live in a simulation. What is reality? Can we know that something is real? Recommendation. So, 
let's sum it up until now. Um, we started with nothing, then we thought maybe the senses will help us, but then no, the, the senses which are far were not good enough. We said maybe the senses, the intimate ones, the ones that are close to us will help us, but then no, they're not good enough as well because I could be dreaming. And when I dream, it is not real. Okay, so then Descartes says maybe it's the universal non-empirical truth that are the basis for certainty, but these are doubtful as well because there could be a possibility when, where we live in a simulation. And if we live in a simulation, everything that we know is actually not certain because this evil demon could plant in our minds that 2 plus 2 equals 5 but in actuality, two, two plus three equals five, but in actuality, two plus three equals six. And the square doesn't really have four sides, it has three. So nothing in these mathematical truths is certain. You wanted to say something? Yeah, I was, uh, was exactly asking the question, like, okay. why would a simulation uh, fortify, you know, the knowledge that sort of the square has four sides and uh, two plus three equals five? Right, that's a great question. Why? I don't know, maybe just for the kicks. Just because it's funny. Or just because, I don't know, maybe it's the way this demon enjoys to see the world. Or that's his idea, but it's not true. It could be. You're right. Maybe simulation could be exactly accurate. But it can also not be exactly accurate. Right? We have... Um, Today we have like The Sims, this computer game, sort of like a simulation. Let's imagine we're The Sims. But, you know, the world of The Sims is not an accurate world. It's sort of almost, but not exactly. But then this simulation can be the same. And we have no way to prove otherwise. So we're stuck. Are we? Well, not really. Because there's an answer. From this point, from the exact point that we are, from this evil demon that sort of fabricates all of reality, Descartes gets to the most basic fundamental certainty, the most basic fundamental truth in philosophy, in modern philosophy, since Descartes. You're there. You're there. Any clues? I think. So, what? I think. So, I think. So, you said that, and I think that's where you were aiming earlier, right? Right. That's the answer, but it's not enough for me. I'm going to ask you why. It's true, like everybody knows or most people know that Descartes had this, this beautiful quote, cogito ergo sum, right? I think, therefore I am. Uh, it's not written in this book. In this book it's a little different, but there's another book where it's written at. And this is the most fundamental certainty and truth of modern philosophy. I agree. But why did we get from the evil demon to the thinking being? How did Descartes just do one move from an evil demon fabricating the totality of reality to the validity of me being a being that thinks? Any clues? Yeah. Uh huh. So how does it do it? Can you can you tell us? You can just start, uh, just, you know, just start talking. We'll do this a discussion. Maybe other people, some more help. How do we get from the evil demon to I exist as a thinking being? Because he thought about the evil demon. Right, so he thought about the evil demon. Why does it mean that he exists as thinking? It's true, you're, you're really close. You're like a centimeter from there. So I, I hear that a lot, and that's a great point, right? Why would the evil being give us the ability to know that the evil being exists? But then, like we said, maybe it's really funny for him. 
you know, it's even worse. We're stuck in this simulation and we know he exists and there's no way out. It's even funnier, you know, he even enjoys it more. So that doesn't necessarily mean that I exist. But something here does mean that I exist. Maybe it's the human ability to reflect on ourselves. Okay. How does the human ability to get to the understanding I exist, I think, which is the understanding we're going to read in one second, how does that come to be from this evil demon that actually falsifies everything? It seems like a big step. It seems like a big step, but it's really tiny. Yeah, Because this being is like, okay, so you think you have a body? No. Maybe the evil being. Right, so it's not about the body, so you don't have a body, right? But you think you exist in the world, but the world doesn't exist, actually. The, the brain maybe the brain doesn't exist. Maybe we don't, we're not even creatures, we're brains. Maybe we're energetic creatures, I don't know, something like that. So the evil... The only thing we can be sure is that we exist as we think. We exist as thinking. Right? How can that not be falsified by the evil demon? That's my last leading question. Like, how can that not, how can the evil demon not fool us here? In the fact that we think. Okay. Do we know there's an evil demon? Maybe. Maybe, could be. Let's go. Let's try. Don't worry, guys. Oh, you have the answer? Uh, no, I don't know that. Okay, a question? <laughs> Mm -hmm. It was like, um, it's, it's the moment when you, like, um, when you realize you are like in reality and isn't it like the 100%, like the, the 100% of what you can say? Yeah, no, it's true. It's this moment of realization. I exist. But then reality does not necessarily exist. Right. It is a moment. It's fleeting. Well, you know, we could all be under the simulation, or you actually are a simulation and only I exist, right? So these are plausible things if we assume that there is a simulation. Yeah? Perfect, excellent. Yeah, this is exactly the point. I'm going I'm to repeat this. I'm going to repeat this point. This is Descartes' point in this moment. Um, let me read what he says, and then we're going to discuss it uh, together. So, um, assuming that there is a deceiver, let's assume there is a deceiver of supreme power and cunning who is deliberately and constantly deceiving me. So, we're assuming that. In that case, I too undoubtedly exist, if he is deceiving me. And let him deceive me as much as he can, he will never bring it about that I am nothing as long as I think that I am something, I am, I exist. So the fact that he is deceiving you, that doesn't actually imply that you exist? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is the point. Uh, even, even if the uh, uh, evil demon deceives me, yeah, he is deceiving me, right? He is deceiving somebody, even if the world is completely false, if nothing is real, if I don't have a body and this whole simulation is absolutely false, I am in the simulation, I exist. How do I exist in the simulation? Not as a body, not as a human, not as a person in the world, all of these might be fabrications of the evil demon. I exist as I think, because this whole charade, this whole theater play, is assembled in my thought. Now, be careful. It doesn't mean that what I think is true, because I can think many things. I can think that 2 plus 2 equals 4, but that can be false. But the thing that is absolutely certain is that when I think, I exist as thinking. In this moment... Ah, oh, sorry. Sorry, 
Right, so that's a great, that's a great uh, comment, and I just didn't know what you meant with your hand, but it's good. So it's good that you asked that. Yeah, it could be possible that the evil demon is fooling us to believe that we are thinking as fooled, right? But still, you know, we don't get out of it. We still are thinking. Even if he fools out to th us to think that we are thinking, he fools us. I am separate from the demon. Okay, that's true, yes. Like the, the demon argument entails a separation from the demon, right? And the next step is like, what am I? Right, so I'm separate, it's true. There is a demon and me and I am being fooled. So that's valid, I am. But then what am I? I am thought, I am thinking, I am a thinking being. That's where Descartes gets us. And you see he is really happy with the apple. I exist as I think. Right? This is, this is where we get in meditation one, in the beginning of meditation two. But the question is, what is this thinking being? So Descartes gives us a list of what it's not. It's not a man. Because, you know, the fact that I'm a man could be a fabrication of the evil demon. It's not the fact that I have a body, a face, hands, limbs, that could be an invention. It's not the world. The world could also be an invention of the evil demon. It's nothing corporal. It's nothing that we can touch, right? Because that's also dependent on the senses where the demon can fool us. It's not even rationality. You know, it's not even the thought that 2 plus 2 equals 4, because that also can be false. It's not any conception of the above. It's the only fact that I exist as a thing that thinks. And like we said, this is a fleeting moment. It's not, it's not a truth that lasts more than this exact moment where you think. If you think right now, you think about yourself, I think, I'm thinking, you understand, yes, I exist as thinking, and you have this like moment where you constitute yourself, where all of a sudden you appear as the think thinking being in your thought. And nothing can take that from you. Not even a most conniving demon take that from you. Right? That's Descartes' basic assumption. Now, we call the thinking being, after Descartes, we gave it a different name, we call it the subject. Right? That's in philosophy today. And philosophy since Descartes puts the subject at its core. That is more modern philosophy. It starts from the subject, right? It starts from this thinking being. And philosophy doesn't have to start from the subject. You know, Aristotle, or let's even better, Socrates started from truth. First, there's truth, there's universal truth. And from truth, we can understand things, right? Aristotle started from the senses. He started from the world. He went to the world and found out truth in the world and learn from that. We had scholastic philosophy, which, which started from God. First, God is true, and then we learn about ourselves, the world, etc. And Descartes is a Christian philosopher, and he starts from the subject. That is groundbreaking. That created modern philosophy as we know it uh, today. Let's, let's have some questions. Yes? So I'm thinking about yeah. You know, I do a lot of meditation and, and like sometimes I feel this rationality can be rational for some and some in some sense sense that something is getting united there. It's like the experience and the thinking is combined together. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is something that I can explain why what? it is just that thing. Yeah. It's not like operating from that, it's just the thought is emerging from that. Right, so it's a moment of emergence, right? I would, I would, also, I would also define it like that. It's not, I, I, it's, that's at least how I see it, and there are many people that have different interpretations to this argument. I'm giving you, like, my perspective on it. I don't think this is a rational argument. I think A, B, because whoever thinks exist, C, I exist. I don't think it's that, because rationality is also in question with the evil demon. It is this moment, this constitutive moment, it's this moment of emergence that all of a sudden this thing inside us, the subject, we're going to talk about this in the lecture about the unconscious, the subject all, all of a sudden emerges. And the subject is nothing positive, it's nothing positivistic. I cannot say what it is exactly, it's not, it's not me, it's not 
what I think about myself. It's not my self-image. It's this empty thing. It's this empty ves vesicle for thought. This is the subject for the cut. Okay. Are we, are we good? Any questions? Or we can continue? Yeah? I needed to be on firm ground, okay? So that was the argument of Descartes. We're not going to go further uh, with Descartes today unless you want to prove the existence of God, and we'll do it in five minutes, but that's soon, okay? Um, there are a couple of problems with Descartes at this point, which I really want to... Um, bring out because I want you to be critical. You know, we just presented Descartes' argument, but you know, we need to be critical in philosophy. So first problem, and that's quite obvious, is the problem that we call the problem of solipsism, the existence of an only soul, or what we call the problem of other minds. So at the moment of what we will call now the cogito, let's call it the moment where I exist as I think, that is, we call it, traditionally we call it the cogito, yeah? I exist, right? I know, I think in my mind right now, yeah, I exist, but what about you guys? Do you exist? I can't really be sure, right? Because you all could be a figment of the uh, evil brain thing, right? The, the whole simulation. I, I know I exist, but what about you guys? So I'm kind of in a world where I'm alone, in this Cartesian world. I'm quite alone in the world and that's kind of lonely. You know, and like, what about you guys? I really believe you're actual people. I, I believe you. you. You seem like it. You act like it. But there's no philosophical way, if I'm basing myself on what we've done until now, to, to base this fact. Right? Question. Yeah. Is that the others could be part of the simulation? Yeah. Or if you conclude that you exist because you think, that yeah. doesn't rule out that it might still be a simulation? Yeah, it could be a simulation. That's, that's exactly true. It could be a simulation, but there's one truth. There's one thing that's certain. I exist as thinking. We're still stuck with the simulation, guys. We're going to see this in the next slide. Right, first part of the simulation is, yeah, you could all be simula simulated. You could all be robots. You know? Maybe when I was young, I thought that when I go home, all my friends go to their houses, lock themselves in the closet, like, and wait for the next time we meet at school. Right? It's, it's an idea. Right? At this point, this might be true. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, let's go. Let's do it's, that. One. It just came up. What if there are actually two evil demons trying to deceive each other? Wow. Okay. And what about me? Where, where am I in this whole drama? You are just, you're just, a, I don't know, a, uh, a tool. Well, then I still exist as thinking, right? Could be a multiplicity of demons. Be careful, the cat is very, very careful not to say that God is deceiving him. It's not God, it's a demon. And yeah, there could be a couple of demons, you know. Maybe a couple yeah. of demons are having the kicks, you know. They're enjoying, having a good time, you know, and making this simulation with you, right? But you still exist as thinking, as this vesicle of thought, right? Yeah. Uh, yes? Mm hmm Right, so ego, like again, that's the way I read Freud, right? And it might be not compelling to, to a lot of schools, but yeah, the ego is sort of a fabrication in Freud. Ego is, the, is a construction, you know? It's what we think about ourselves. It's what Freud called the ideal ich, or the ich ideal. Like it's this ideal we adopt from outside. Maybe a demon, maybe you think your mom, mom is a demon, I don't know. But we adopt this concept of ourselves. I am a good boy, right? or I'm so clever, right? That's me. We adopt this from the outside. Well, some people view the demon as a sort of an other, you know, a, maybe a mother even, right? But you're right. Ego is sort of a fabrication at this point. But there is the subject. And the subject is truth, is basic truth. I believe also in psychoanalysis. I believe that's the strength of psychoanalysis. The subject is always there. It's always assumed everywhere, right? Great, great comment. Okay. Any, anything else? Well, it's like, it's not, I think the stability was maybe a cathode in the fiction. So uh -huh. it's just out of dialectics. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting line between dialectical thought and wisdom. Mm -hmm. In dialectical thought, you feel the world is divided into the opposites. Opposites. 
Okay. Okay, and direct, non direct suffering is this exact thing. Like the subject is getting involved with rationality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. For Descartes, there's a huge split in reality. We're not going to discuss it because it comes much later, but for Descartes, there's a dualism, there's a duality. There's a world and there's a place for the soul. And he also found a place in the brain, the pituitary gland. He said, this is the place where our rational soul, our thinking being sort of like places itself in the corporal world and views it through there. That was Descartes' idea. Again, this has been not very fruitful, uh, but that's, that's something that he said in his book. Again, this book is great. I recommend reading it until the second meditation, and then okay, sort of giving. It's, it's not a third eye, it's sort of like he says we're like sailors. The soul is like a sailor on a ship, and the body is a ship, and the soul affects the body. And it's, it's a whole other subject about the mind body problem. But yeah, if you're interested, definitely find it there or contact me. Next problem, because uh, we're reaching uh, the end of the lecture, is the problem of the external world. Because, yeah, we proved that I exist, but then what about the world? The world could be a fabrication of the evil demon. So we're living as a thinking being without knowing that anybody else is actually a thinking being. We're sort of alone, and there is no world. So what about science? Right? That was our goal. That was Descartes' goal from the beginning. There is no science because there is no world. So what do we do? At this point, Descartes sort of calls... God for some help. And this is a very nice uh, quote uh, from Blaise Pascal. I cannot forgive Descartes in all his philosophy. He would have been quite willing to dispense with God, but he had to make him give a flick of the forefinger to start the world in motion. Beyond this, he has no further need for God. Meaning Pascal is sort of like, he's furious because Descartes started without God. He started from the thinking being. But then when he needs some help because there's no world, there's no other people, he calls God. So I'm going to present this argument about God very briefly because it's, it's really a whole, a whole deal. And I think the argument until now was quite great, wonderful. And here we're starting to sort of lose the grip. That's again my interpretation. But we have Descartes and we have the Cogito, and we have the existence of this thinking being. And what Descartes says that this moment of understanding, this point where we comprehend that we exist as thinking, is what he calls a clear and distinct idea. It's clear because there's no doubt about it. It's distinct because it's one idea and it's not mixed with other ideas. It's sort of like this perfect eureka moment. It's sort of like um, this amazing eureka moment of I exist, right? So that starts with the cogito. And Descartes says that if we start with the cogito, we can also go to mathematics. And in mathematics, we can also have these moments of these understandings of a clear and distinct idea, right? And what Descartes says, he says, okay, so we call God for help. And we, says God, we say God is infinite, independent, smart, strong, perfect, but mostly we said that God is good. That's something very important for Descartes. And what he said is, Basically this, I'm kind of simplifying it, but he said that because God is good, he would never make us get to these clear and distinct ideas if they weren't true. That's too evil. That just doesn't work with God. God wouldn't do this to us. So what Descartes says is that if we have a clear and distinct idea and God exists, which we need to prove, then anytime we have a clear and distinct idea, we know this is true. Like the moment of the cogito, that's certainty. Or other mathematical truths. If we get to a mathematical equation, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, and we have this clear and distinct idea about it, again, I'm simplifying, then because God is good, this has to be true. So if we base mathematics on clear and distinct ideas, we can base science on mathematics, the existence of the world on science, like physics, and the existence of other people from these other arguments. So that's basically how Descartes brings back the world and the existence of other people. Right? I see you're not very convinced. Uh, me too. Me too. But that's how it goes. Okay, we just need to, to accept it. Right? Uh, some people are really ins insistent on, on its validity. Um, yeah? We'll continue and then do two proofs really quickly. Yes? Do we have to accept this as an axiom that God is good? 
Yeah, this is axiomatic. This is sort of, you know, because up until this point, we didn't really need God. We were like, oh, maybe it's the senses, maybe it's that, da, 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 evil demon, blah, blah, blah. God was not part of it. But now when we need the world, we sort of need to call God. And the axiom is that God is good. Yeah. Well, because then he won't be God, right? That's, that's, that's a major thing. We're going to see this in one of the proofs of God's existence right now. But then if God wasn't good, he wouldn't be God. He would be just another creature. God is perfect. He's infinite. Right? The thing about good, that's also very Socratic. You know, for Socrates, the essence of truth was goodness, but good. The good. God is the good. And that's, again, you know, Descartes is a Christian, and that's, that's how it is. I don't know, we, 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 we shouldn't uh, criticize that because that's where he comes from. Today, you know, we, some of us maybe are atheists or, uh, or agnostic or whatever, but for Descartes, that was quite basic, right? So that's what he does. I agree, not very convincing. I just don't get why yeah. God being good is more basic than square being square. That's a very valid point. Right, but I think the spirit of the time would sort of say, yeah, that's, that's more, yeah? Because if God is not good, then there is no God, and to think that there is no God is too far-fetched for the God. For instance, okay, we're getting to like anthropological explanations, but you know, if, if, you, if you do a bachelor's in philosophy, you run into a lot of like crazy things, like everything is water. You know, that's like a basic philosophical assumption of like a very important philosopher in the, in the past of philosophy. Every, everything is water. Yeah. But then like, you know, we can say, well, no, everything is not water, right? But then we'll be anachronistic, right? That's an anachronistic criticism, meaning like from today, we know, today we obviously know that not everything is water. Right? And we're going to say, hey, you're, you're kind of silly because you think everything is water. Right? But when you read philosophy, you sort of need to like, accept the basic axioms and see if they work. Right? And I'll tell you the truth, it doesn't even work if we accept this. Okay, I'm going to show you in one second okay, why it doesn't work. Yes? Yeah, I was thinking um, was just about the paradox. Mm -hmm. Okay, the mathematical equation, yeah, equation, formula, right. Then what will happen? Yeah, it would take out the paradox, no? Like when you, when you would change, like he doesn't imprecise, in, imprecise this paradox, that's why God is good, like God is only good. Right, right. Yeah, but you're saying that it's not necessarily true, that God is only good. Am I getting you? Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's, that's very true. Right? But what Descartes is doing is not really interested in that. He's interested first in proving that God exists. So basically, if we assume that God is infinite, independent, blah, 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 and good, and if we assume there are clear and distinct ideas, and if we assume that a God that is good will never let us have indistinct, uh, clear and distinct ideas which are false, then all we have to do is to prove that God exists and is good. Right? So let's do that well, really quickly. Um, I'm really happy always to convert people to believe in God. Um, so, the first proof for the existence of God. Here we go. Think about it. When I think of God, I have the idea in my mind of an infinite, infinitely perfect being. Think about it. Think about God for a second. Hmm. So he's infinitely perfect and I have this idea. I'm going to go to, to church, to the synagogue. Mosque, I have this infinite idea in my mind. Now, everything must have a cause, according to Descartes, you know. There's nothing that doesn't have a cause, right? And every cause is always bigger or equal to what comes of the cause. Like, there's no way that something smaller would be the cause of something bigger, according to the logic uh, of Descartes. So he says, the cause of the idea of God has to be at least infinitely perfect, right? Because the idea is the idea of infinity and perfection, the cause of the idea has to be at least bigger or at least equal or bigger than infinity or perfection. Now it's quite obvious that me, you and Descartes are not perfect. We sometimes do mistakes, although some of us think we are. Well, you're not. 
Uh, and God is infinitely perfect, that's for sure. So God is the cause of the idea in my mind. Therefore, God exists. Right? This is one proof. Right? You're sort of squinting. And yes, I agree, because it doesn't really work. Right? But we need to, to, to go like a bit deeper. We're, it, it sort of seems strange, but let's do a philosophical uh, analysis of this thing. Uh, Okay, so at this point, you know, Descartes has these mathematical truths and logical truths, and they're not true, they're not valid. So he goes and asks God, please make these valid. Please make me believe, make me know that these are valid. So at the point where Descartes goes to prove the existence of God, mathematical and logical truths are invalid. We're trying to prove they're valid by God existing. Now, in order to provide them with validity, like we said, Descartes goes to God. He says, God, please exist, so we know that these are valid. But in this proof, he uses these truths at the course of the proof, right? He had this very basic logical assumption that everything must have a cause, and this cause has to be bigger or equal to it. This is a logical axiom. So Descartes wants to prove the validity of logic and mathematics through the existence of God, but then he proves the existence of God through the validity of logics and mathematics. This is a circular argument, which is not valid. So we're not doing great right now, but there's another one. Okay, last one for today. Let's see if this one gets you. Uh, my conception of God is the conception of a being that possesses all perfections. Okay, so God is perfect, infinite, and possesses everything, right? Existence, as a concept, is part of perfection. Being perfect is also to exist. Therefore, I cannot conceive of God as not existing. Therefore, God exists. This is uh, known as the valley and hill argument, because when we think of a valley, there's no way not to conceptualize a hill as well. Because there's no valley without a hill. Think about it. There's no hill with no valley. Each one necessarily implies the other. Right? So what Descartes says is that there is no God without existence because God is infinite and complete and perfect and existence is part of it. So I cannot conceptualize God without conceptualizing existence. Sounds good? Not so much. Um, I'll tell you what. Actually, there is poss a possible universe where there are no valleys and there are no hills. Maybe, okay, but let's stay uh, on firmer grounds. Uh, the fact that when we think about a valley, necessar we necessarily think about a mountain, doesn't necessarily mean that they both exist. Uh, the same way, uh, if I think about God as necessarily including the concept of existence, doesn't necessarily mean that they actually exist. Because, you know, I can invent many concepts in my mind and have these interactions between these concepts, but it doesn't actually mean that they exist in reality. Because, you know, if that was true, we would have much more unicorns in reality. Or let's say, whenever I think about a, a horse, I think about a unicorn. Whenever I think about a unicorn, I think about a horn. You know, I can play with these concepts forever, but it doesn't mean that these concepts actually have an existence. Well, we can say this is the beginning, yeah. Like di dialect dialectical thinking started with Socrates, but it's sort of like it's a different take. And to the, today the take is more Hegelian. Sorry? Well, yeah, well, for, Descartes definitely wants to stay in the dualism. He doesn't want to go out of it. But you know, his followers would obviously try to take us out of that, of that place, right? But what, what we have here is sort of like two attempts to prove the existence of God in order to make the world, math, science, everything valid. So today we see that these don't actually work so great, but it doesn't mean that God does, does not exist. I don't know, I don't want to, to blow any bubbles. And maybe the cat was like on, a, on the right way. But currently, that's uh, what we view of the second part of the cat's uh, work. Uh, so... Um, Generally, I just, uh, um, I just wanted uh, today to present this whole argument which leads us from nothing to a major certainty. 
And then we have this second step that has to go through God and maybe we are not so convinced, but still we have this beautiful argument which brings us from radical skepticism to the most basic truth in modern philosophy up until this day, the subject, the thinking being. That is the basis for philosophical thought. And that started with this guy, Descartes, that was constantly describing himself in his nightgown in this beautiful, beautiful book. Uh, so I really recommend uh, you guys read this book. It's really interesting in all languages. And I hope you sort of like enjoyed this lecture. I did, so that's wonderful. And also, um, we're going to be here next week uh, in a, a lecture about paradoxes and the limits of thought. Really fun lecture with a lot of paradoxes. So I hope to see you again here. Um, any questions? So we can finish. And anyone not wants to talk later, I'm here. So thank you. Okay. Thanks.